Hi, this is Jeroen of Salesware and you're listening to SaaS Holes. I'm leading an intelligence serum that SaaS sales teams love to use. So today we're going to talk not just RevOps and SaaS, but also sales and CRM. Welcome to SaaS Holes, a show dedicated to issues within the software as a service industry. We are revenue ops with a... Edge. Not bad. <laughs> Jamie's asleep. <laughs> 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 Jamie, Jason, KG, myself, Pete have a combined 100 years of making interesting decisions. Please subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Hey, today our guest is Jeroen Kordout. Jeroen is a co-founder and CEO of Salesflare. It's an intelligent CRM built for small, medium businesses selling B2B, most popular with agencies and fast-growing startup companies. Salesflare itself was founded when Jeroen and his co-founder at Levin wanted to follow up the leads for their software company in an easier way. They didn't like to keep track of their leads manually and built Salesflare, which pulls customer data together automatically and then actively helps you follow up. It's now the most popular CRM on Product Hunt and top rated on review platforms like G2 for its ease of use and automation features. Ask Yeroon anything about sales automation, data fun, or Belgian beers. But before we get to Yeroon, we got a sponsor today, guys. This episode is brought to you by NeuroNoodle. Hey, parents of athletes, get a doodle of their noodle, which is a brain map, so you have a baseline to compare it to. You get a physical every year, right? Well, schedule an appointment now at NeuroNoodle.com. It takes only 20 minutes to get the data you need to ensure the quality of your athlete's future life. Carney. Yeah, KG. <laughs> Lay it on me. This furniture store keeps calling me. All I wanted was one night stand. Leave us some comments on our blog at sassholes.net. Got any shout outs, KG? <laughs> I got a couple of shout outs here. Um, Bromley Shields from back in the um, back in the business.com days, knows, used to be known as Bromley Spatola, uh, for being promo uh, promoted to global strategic account manager of the tech vertical at Uber. That's a long title. Uh, congratulations to Devin Montgomery, formerly of Upkeep, for being promoted to senior emerging account executive. Um, uh, sorry, still with Upkeep. Sorry, he got a promotion. He didn't leave. Jasmine, Jazzy J, Jasmine Lee for starting a new position uh, at, uh, as partnerships manager at Helium 10. Greg Kim, uh, another LA executive for being promoted to CRO at coaching.com. And, and I trust me, this is my last one. So many shout outs this week. Uh, congratulate Lindsay Bens uh, Benscome. I always pronounce her. She got married and messed it up. Ben uh, Ben Cosme. That was it. Uh, for starting as senior enterprise account manager at Snag a Job. Snag a Job still exists, Pete. It I is. I can't believe that still exists. Yeah, it's, they 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 crush it. it. They crush it in retail. No, they're old school. What about you, JC? Steve done again. I want to give him a shout out. I worked with him at Flexair. He just left his SVP of sales and me and APAC at Clearbridge and uh, Ski Blanchard uh, as a data engineer at Sales Loft. I want to give those two shout outs. They just started this week. <laughs> nice. Uh, Andrew Land, three years at Jump Crew. Way to go, Andrew. Old school. Remember him, JC? Oh, yeah. Andrew Morey, seven years at Chronicle Media LLC, Chief Revenue of Officer. Thank you for your service, Andrew. And we oh, got some, we got some birthday. Got yeah. Well, I got one other one. I want to wish, uh, you know, I, I caught up with Derek Frere, who worked with uh, Pete two times. He said he had two tours of duty under you. I caught him. I, I met him for coffee uh, yesterday. So I want to give him a shout out. He's over at Keep Trucking as one of their heads, customer success uh, people. He he helped open the uh, London office, I believe. He did. He did career fairs. You remember the career fair product we had? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Sarah Clem, happy birthday. Mike Zatko, happy birthday. Mike Odell, happy birthday. And Christina Cruz, happy birthday. Blow out the candles. <laughs> happy birthday. Okay, Yeroon, tell us about yourself. How'd you get to uh, where you're at today? Tell us about your uh, product. I've been working now for seven, eight years. Depends where you start counting. Uh, on Salesflare, um, 
we started after some frustrating time with Salesforce first. Uh, I had to work with that product for about four years and uh, never really got to using it for myself. It was mostly for, for management I was using it for sales reporting. All of the other stuff I would do to organize myself to make more sales was done in, in Outlook and in some task lists, but never in Salesforce. At some point, um, I started my current co-founder on a, on a software company. It was, it was in business intelligence. We were like um, mining data basically. And we had a lot of good leads to follow up with. And we wanted something to organize ourselves better because we're naturally not really great at uh, <laughs> following up a lot of leads. And all of the CRMs we tried required such a big amount of work uh, that we can never keep up with it. We started dreaming about something that would actually uh, do all the data follow-up for us, that would keep track of everything, like who did we last email, uh, have a meeting with, call, did they open our emails, did they go to the website, uh, what kind of data is available in their email signatures and company databases and all those kind of things. A system that plugs into all of these places and, and collects it automatically and organizes it for us so we can focus on not the data part, which is much better done by computers, uh, but on the real sales part, uh, which is having the conversations with customers, following them up correctly. And an idea we had now uh, almost eight years ago, uh, we, we quickly figured that it wasn't just something we were struggling with, that a lot of people are frustrated by their CRMs. And initially we thought we were going to build something that would complement Salesforce, uh, for larger companies, uh, but we very quickly uh, pivoted to smaller companies because we ended up building something that was uh, more built for the end user. And the big companies didn't really care about that too much, while the, the smaller ones really saw the, the value there. Uh, so right now we're, we're selling to a lot of small companies. I think we have over 2,000 using our software. It's mostly agencies and SaaS companies, actually, yeah. tech companies in general expanding uh, as we speak. Yeah, many, more? many of my clients or uh, my, my consulting clients, Irun, are using, um, are using Pipedrive and HubSpot, CR, uh, HubSpot CRM. And, and it's, it's, I don't know what it is about Salesforce. I mean, I wouldn't personally, I've used it since 2001. So I wouldn't go to a company that didn't have it because I know it and I know how to, how to use it. It's super expensive. Many of my financial leaders hated Salesforce. They just hated Salesforce, um, and uh, you know, CFOs, controllers, and things like that. Yarun, what is it? <laughs> What's what is like? Why does this? Why is there this opening? You'd think that Salesforce would just dominate, and they would figure this stuff out, you know, themselves with all the resources and all the companies they go by, mm -hmm. uh, go and purchase. What what is it that they've they what have you figured out that CRM stock ticker has not figured out? Well, well, well first of all, you're, you're still partly blaming it on yourself. And this is also what we so, saw uh, eight years ago when we started doing customer interviews. We said we're going to build a better CRM and people would say like, well, you know, it's, it's not really the CRM. They're as good as they will be. Uh, it's the salespeople. They're lazy. Uh, that's That's really the issue. If you just force these salespeople to fill out the CRM, everything will be fine. And uh, people would then start listing all the things they did uh, for that. They would have assistants fill out the CRM instead of the salespeople. They would uh, take away their bonuses if they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Some people would go as far as firing them. Uh, they had all kinds of ways, uh, but nobody really thought about making better software. So we thought, oh, that's, that's weird. Um, <laughs> when it comes to Salesforce, they cannot do everything. Basically, what Salesforce is is a, is a huge packet of build, building blocks uh, with which consultants can build something great for a big company. Because in a really big company, yeah. uh, what people want is something uh, that adapts to their workflows. And that's what Salesforce is built for. It's a sort of, it's a platform in which you build your own software almost. Uh, but if you build something highly customizable, it sort of starts taking a, a, a generic shape and there's all kinds of trade-offs uh, that then uh, basically these trade-offs are at the expense of the end user. The organization wants it a certain way and it needs to adapt to the organization so much 
the end users are stuck with something which is not entirely built for them to use. Interesting. Uh, especially if then consultants also come in and 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 then uh, create in a certain way that which then also doesn't work really great. Uh, companies will still keep focusing on uh, consultants making it better uh, instil, is, instead of figuring out that it's, it's never going to work for the end user. Yeah, I mean, if you, you, I, I would agree with what you just said. If you customize your Salesforce instance, let's be honest, CRO's tenure is average less than three years. Every CRO is going to come in probably with a different sales strategy. And if you customize your sales strategy, oh, it's 18 months. Um, I saw uh, 24 but it's 18 months is the average CRO tenure. They come in with their own sales strategy. If you customized your sales force and built your sales force to that customized sales process, you basically over-engineered your sales force and you're causing a lot of pain. And that's what happens in a lot of early instances. People nowadays are just tearing down their old sales force and building up a new one, or they're looking for add-ons to sort of support that process inside Salesforce. And it becomes drunken tool confetti once you start doing all of that stuff. That's exactly what happens. And that's how people keep themselves busy with something that's never going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always someone new who wants it a different way. Uh, if we just customize it that way, it's going to work. If we just add that add-on, we, uh, we take away that weakness of Salesforce. Uh, it doesn't really happen. But in the meantime, uh, Salesforce is making a lot of money and uh, all the, the whole consultant ecosystem around it, which which helps Salesforce to be that big, also keeps making a lot of money. Now, you recently wrote a blog. Uh, I think the title was SaaS Sales, The Fundamentals, All You Need to Know to Kill It in Sales. What do our uh, reps listening to the show need to know to kill it in SaaS sales, Jeroen? The, 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 if you read the blog post, you'll see that it, it all starts from the, the, the size of the customers in SaaS, which makes a huge difference. And uh, we use the animals uh, model there, uh, which uh, um, I'm thinking about his name now. It's a guy from um, Point Nine Capital, Christoph Jans, uh, came up with, uh, which start, starts with mice and goes all the way to uh, whales, I believe. Uh, based on that, your sales approach will be wildly different. And the blog post, I think you can find it if, if as a listener, you type SaaS sales, Salesflare into Google. Uh, we'll then go into detail about uh, how for every different size of animal, uh, there is a different approach. I can maybe add to that, that uh, the most important things, I think generally, um, and that's what I hear. I have, a, I have a podcast myself, which is called Founder Coffee, with SaaS Founders. And when I ask about uh, people um, what makes the most successful in SaaS, uh, the following things come back. One, it's being very, very clear on the targets. Um, the clearer you are on the target, and actually a lot of companies uh, made their targeting um, uh, even more strict during the pandemic because they wanted to uh, achieve a higher um, return on their sales machine. Uh, so they made uh, a more um, a smaller target audience, let's say. That is really, really key, uh, nailing that. Uh, because as, as uh, some people will tell you, like the, the founder of Superhuman, uh, for instance, would say is that if you if 40% of your audience uh, really cannot miss your service, then then you've reached product market fit, but you can you can get that product market fit just by making your target audience uh, uh, smaller, uh, because it's it's really about uh, the fit with your target audience and not the market as a whole. Um, and then you can you can achieve a, a much higher return on your on your on your sales machine. Getting I mean having a, an effective process from uh, from a very early lead to to a lead at the end is very important. So it's really about aligning marketing and sales. There's a lot of talk about that. But then um, the third thing and something we really focus on very, very uh, deeply is um, onboarding. And it's not just because onboarding um, increases your conversion, but a good onboarding has an immense effect as well on your churn. So on the amount of customers you lose over time. Uh, we see that in our own data. Uh, people who within our trial periods get set up really well 
are least likely to churn and it's and it's with a huge difference so we do a lot of effort there to make sure that people really understand everything get set up correctly don't just jump in and use the software or i mean the, the people who who uh start a trial and pay us immediately we like it <laughs> but on the other hand we also know that they're going to go away really quickly uh because they they don't think their decision is true and and they they don't get uh, set up uh, properly. For ma many software packages, I mean, come on, Jamie, if if uh, People AI just you know is installed and out of the box, and there's no real good onboarding, I, you know, it doesn't Switching doesn't work con. very well. Yeah, Switching exactly. Con. Doesn't, doesn't well, work that's that why well. you sign a three year deal when those occur. But anyways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's it going up against uh, Salesforce? Like, how do you sell your product, Yarun? That must be. I remember when Salesforce first came out, they had to educate the market. And I think they gave us, this was like 98, 99. They gave out five free licenses to try it for a while before you bought. Do you go up against current Salesforce customers and sell against them? Or do you find people that don't use any CRM at all? Uh, we have a bit of both. I think it's probably half half. Um, and now we didn't. So so there is there is a, a large portion of companies that uh, still use the spreadsheets for some reason. Um, spreadsheets are not uh, super helpful, but they're very malleable. Uh, so you can sort of build your own system. Anyway, why a lot of companies a, still use that. Why does a customer leave Salesforce to go to you? Like, what are the reasons? How do you get the fifty percent to come over? Yeah, so of, the, of that 50% part comes from Salesforce. That's uh, usually the larger companies we get on our software. And part of uh, comes from uh, Pipedrive and HubSpot, uh, the other companies you uh, mentioned earlier. Actually, more from HubSpot nowadays than from Pipedrive. Um, the ones from Salesforce, um, they are just extremely frustrated with their sales team not using it. It's really the, the easiest customers to sell to. Uh, because they, they have a huge pain. Basically, they made a huge investment that is not paying off. And they want something that their sales team is actually going to use. Then if, you, uh, if you're talking about HubSpot and Pipedrive, there the difference already becomes smaller. They're still, we're, we're still the only one that is built for with like automated data input first and, and uh, manual data input second, while, while they are the other way around. Uh, but the, the difference already becomes smaller because they're more built for end users where, where Salesforce is not built for end users at all. That's so interesting. I mean, I love you, you're, you've, you're onto something by saying, you know, hey, Salesforce user, HubSpot user, Pipedrive user, it's not your fault. It's not your salespeople's fault. Come to us and we can actually show you what real, I, I, think, I think that's great. You know, Pete touched on... Um, Pete touched on you compete, you know, the smaller SaaS company going after the OG, really the first SaaS company or one of the first SaaS companies out there, a bigger, a bigger company. Um, I think you all, you also have some opinions on generally speaking, how smaller SaaS businesses can compete with bigger SaaS businesses. Yeah. I believe essentially uh, that it's by uh, using your special advantages as a small company. Uh, in a big company, everything is about scale. Uh, and it, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that are, are very hard to scale. Um, and that's exactly the things you should focus on as a small business. So a, a few examples. Uh, delivering great customer service is way harder in a, in a big company than it is in a small company. Uh, staying close to customers is way harder in a big company as in a small company because you need to hire a lot of people quickly uh, that are very disconnected uh, from the building of the product that sort of half know what's going on there uh, that are, if they need a developer or so, are very far from it. Everything is sort of disconnected uh, in a bigger company. And that's not their fault. That's just because it's super hard to do something in a, in a, like that in a big company. So that's a, something as a small business you can very easily play out. So it requires two things. No, three things, actually. A really great sales process. Uh, the, uh, a lot of empathy per customer. 
and the organization and discipline or systems to scale that across customers. Bruno, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what's the best way for the listeners to learn more about your connect with you, Jeroen? Uh, if you want to learn more about Salesflare, uh, salesflare.com is the best place. So it's sales and then Flare, F-L-A-R-E. Um, you can read about the software. You can find our blog with all the articles you mentioned uh, there as well if you click on blog. Or you can try the software um, at the top right. Uh, just try it. It starts with seven days, but you get 30 days in the end if you if you set up the software. Uh, we reward you with extra days. Uh, precisely because of what I mentioned earlier, that onboarding is so key. Uh, we reward people for, for getting onboarded well. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, uh, LinkedIn is uh, probably the best place. Uh, there's only one person with my exact name. If you, if you find it somewhere, it's, it's a bit difficult to spell out. Um, and my name is in Dutch, so I'm, I'm Belgian. Um, but you can connect with me there. Send me a personal uh, message with the connection request. Um, because otherwise I will assume it's, it's more spam. Uh, but if you, if you send that personal message, I'll certainly uh, connect with you and we can have a chat. We'll have all the links in the podcast notes, your own. Thank you cool. again. Hey, thanks for listening to the Sassholes. On behalf of Jamie KG and myself, Pete, we thank you for listening. We ask that you give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Or you can always buy us a beer on Patreon slash Sassholes. We thank you for listening. Cue the music.